Uh, good afternoon uh, and uh, for the uh, next panel discussion, uh, this is on exploring trends in online learning, upskilling, employability, emerging skills and future of work. So very important, uh, basically one, how online learning has become uh, not just a matter of choice but a matter of compulsion today and how can it help in upskilling and uh, improve uh, with more emerging skills coming uh, in quality of uh, emerging workforce. Uh, so for this panel uh, we have a very eminent set of panelists and it's my pleasure to call uh, the panelists on uh, stage. Uh, Dr. Tabrez Ahmed Vice Chancellor, G.D. Goenka University, Sona. A round of applause for Dr. Tabrez. Next, we have Dr. Shashi Anand Sridharan, Vice President of Kalasalingam University. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Sridharan. A round of, uh, Dr. Sridharan, uh, he might be joining in. Uh, so next uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Sujata Shahi, Vice Chancellor, IILM University Guru Gram. Welcome Dr. Sujata. I would like to welcome Dr. Shibram Khara, Vice Chancellor, Sharda University, Noida. I would like to also welcome uh, Jaspreet Singh, Head of Marketing and Public Relations Finance Sphere. Uh, can we have uh, Jaspreet on stage? Okay, so, uh, so uh, I think a couple of panelists, Dr. Sridharan and Jaspreet, uh, will... Uh, and yeah, I can see Jaspreet also. So uh, we have this uh, panel discussion on, uh, as I mentioned, uh, very important uh, correlating uh, online learning uh, with better employability and better quality uh, workforce, how they are emerging. And uh, for this, uh, my first question, uh, and uh, let's start with Dr. Tabrez. Uh, let's start with Dr. Tabrez. My first question is, uh, we have been hearing this over the last couple of days and also uh, recently that uh, especially uh, one of the problems during the virtual classrooms that were happening in the last couple of years were the lack of experiential learning, especially in labs. Uh, where in labs uh, you need to ultimately, if you are looking at improving the quality of workforce, actual industry situations, how can they be simulated in labs? And when uh, the teaching was happening in an online mode, so that's a double challenge. So Dr. Tabriz, I'll start with you. Really, how can you simulate industry situations in labs for better experiential learning? That too in an online mode. Thank you, Rajneesh, for asking a very good question. Thank the APAC for inviting me in this program. So this is very important because it talks about the practical aspects of the learning and challenges we face during the pandemic. So uh, there are two kinds of learning. One is the content-based learning that uh, you can uh, make them learn in any way, whether online or offline. There is no challenge on the performance or skill orientation or the personalism of the students. But some of the areas, we cannot shift to the uh, online mode. We learn during the pandemic. One of them is uh, really getting the lab work or practical work. You talk about the engineering. I also talk about the legal education is a moot court. Generally, moot court is one of the very important aspects for legal education. We generally do in the physical mode. But thanks to the pandemic, uh, people have realized and also tried to simulate in the online mode. And they are successful. So in the mooting, at least every law school tried to shift to the online mode. And they are greatly successful because it was mostly argumentation and research. So first thing is the research. Research you can do better by engaging a lot of good online journals where you can access the material throughout the world. 
but the question is regarding the pricing and financial uh, kind of the viability every uh, uh, law school will not be able to really have the good material those who are the potentially sound because in legal education very fast updates are happening and we have to even cite the cases held yesterday because today something will be said by supreme court of india it is law of the land by default we have to follow same thing may happen in the uh, uh, engineering education where something may be invented uh, by somebody may be uh, going to change scenario provide better efficiency uh, for application of any technology or knowledge uh, then thanks to also the pandemic people have uh, virtual labs people experimented virtual labs and it is quite successful it is not 100 percent but quite successful in terms of that the saving of the time and energy because making the lab is very heavy investment and also engaging students is very very kind of uh, the heavy task but organizing the virtual lab and then experimenting and also because of the simulation i think it is greatly successful if you compare the pricing so i think thanks to pandemic and thanks to people try to uh, become very un innovative trying to find out the real solutions in this scenario and also sharing the lot of resources if virtual lab is somewhere in the foreign country anybody can use it so some of the at least IT companies came forward, they have shared the resources because of their kind of the uh, social aspects and lot of school got benefits, you know, she got benefit in this pandemic. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Shridhar and I'll come to you uh, to next. Uh, I was moderating one panel of the, uh, with the representations from IITs, IIMs and NITs today. And uh, one important point was uh, that topic was on industry academia collaboration and the qu concern was that uh, industry does not get so much involved in uh, training the faculty or reorienting the faculty if I may use. Uh, otherwise, uh, these new industry standards and uh, things, uh, the faculty are a little backdated. And uh, also those changes uh, or new or things are not often incorporated in the academic curriculum also. So what uh, is your view, uh, what are your views on these two aspects, more uh, faculty industry coordination and uh, how do you incorporate more industry oriented changes in the curriculum? So thank you for the opportunity. So as you rightly said, there is a gap and I think, you know, we talk, we have been talking about this gap for years together and we will be talking about this gap in the years to come also between industry and academia. Yes, when we compare India versus Western countries, wherein in the Western countries, how universities are an integral part of R&D for the industry. It is not the case, you know, as we all know in India, because industries have their own R&D division and the focus is on, because industry believes in a very quick turnaround, but whereas academia is always the one which is playing catch up. So how can we go about mitigating this, like, you know, in terms, I wouldn't say slowness, but in terms of how quick academia can adapt itself is something academicians and institutions need to think about. Do we want to wait for one batch of students to pass out before considering that the syllabus, what is the value of the syllabus and then change because the technology which is there today will not be there four years from now because industry has already moved on and we have, we, I wouldn't say wasted, we have spent our time training students in a technology which will go obsolete in four years. So that is the half-life of technology which we also need to look at. So with that aspect, where I foresee how institutions can engage industry is having industry, like you know, I'm sure almost every institution would have an industry advisory board or like you know, people from industry like you know, involved in framing the syllabus. Yes, the syllabus framing industry is involved, but the most important is like you know, when we look at a faculty member or an institution, we are teaching, are the students learning? So have industry also involved in the delivery and the assessment part. So let me give you a quick example of what we implemented this year in Kalasalingam University in Tamil Nadu. Is that for every possible course, wherever possible, we called in industry experts to co-teach a course and co-assess the course. So that like, you know, we don't, like industry doesn't tell, yes, this is the syllabus, teach this, then go back and then say you have not taught them properly. 
So we asked industry, like, you know, be a partner, take on the burden, let us deliver the course together, let us assess the students, to, uh, students together, so that the fixes can be made then and there. So that, like, you know, ultimately we want our students to benefit, and when the graduates come out, industry benefits by having trained students and so that they can be deployed from day one also. So let us be involved in the process and to be honest, not many industries came forward because this is a, at an additional cost to them. So with this meant, uh, but like, you know, I foresee going forward more and more because they, you know, when we are able to convince them that it would help them in the long run, more and more industries would come forward. So with this partnership, not only in the framing of the syllabus, but along with delivery and assessment, would definitely help in having a very a strong industry academia collaboration which would then lead to the production of strong graduates from the campus and also the same trained graduates for the industry as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so two things I liked. One, uh, the half-life of the curriculum that you mentioned. Very interesting point. And the second was uh, initially I was very encouraged when you mentioned uh, you got industry to come as for co-teaching and but then you said the response was not uh, as expected so that's where the challenge lies and i'll come to you dr sujata now uh, from both the sides uh, uh, how do you uh, from an institution uh, side involve more the industry and what do you expect from the industry in terms of helping uh, reorient the faculty so that uh, the students uh, get updated on industry knowledge. Thank you and thank you APAC for organizing this conference on such a special day. Today is World Skill Day and we are talking about reskilling, upskilling and employability. Everybody knows the current situation in India that uh, we have our students, 30% students are working on the job which are not available, redundant, but still we have no choice, we are replacing them. But what you said, industry, academia, marrying these two uh, separate entity is important. Not only one way, academia, like our fellow colleague, he said like we can give certain courses to uh, corporate people who can uh, teach, co even teach co-teach or assess. This is one way to involve industry. But our faculty members, they are not trained, they are not aware about futuristic development in organization. This is the big gap. And usually what happens in Western uh, universities, companies are opening the lab within the premises of uh, university. So student and uh, corporate people or faculty jointly, they can work on product development or any kind of innovation. So student is also aware, faculty is also upskilled about the product. But my suggestion is we can have the way we are teaching with case study. So many things are happening in organization, in corporate world. They can come up with certain cases which can be integrated with our course. Our faculty members can go there, a job shadow kind of thing. Even one day, a faculty is shadowing one leader in organization. He or she will get to know, apart from technical knowledge, what kind of interpersonal skills, leadership, these are required. This is one job shadow I can suggest. Another is give chance to us as being an academia to go and stay in that organization for a week, for 15 days, we are willing to allow our faculty members to go and upskill themselves. Reskilling is different, moving, but upskill themselves. And we are actually not aware, they are not coming forward, what they are going to do and develop certain products which can be taught to our student right now. Got this it. is the challenge we are facing. Thanks. Uh, so till now we have discussed uh, basically the topic of the discussion. There are two uh, underlying themes around it. We have discussed the upskilling and the reskilling and making uh, the workforce more industry oriented employable. The other part was the online part and the online part, the challenge there is and I'll come to Dr. Shibram Khara on this. 
with Indian condition, uh, a connectivity infrastructure is not uniform across the country. And especially when last two years we're talking about uh, students, many students, uh, uh, they might have gone uh, anywhere to their home states or hometowns. <coughs> and the uniformity of connectivity infrastructure was not there. Second is, uh, again, looking at the socioeconomic condition of the students, the costs and the economics involved are also uh, difficult maybe for everyone. So keeping all these things in mind, uh, while you have to maintain what we have discussed till far, uh, this uh, trying to bring the academy institution at par with the industry, but at the same time uh, maintaining the infrastructural and financial challenges. So how would you be managing that? Dr. Shibram Kada. A uh, very good question, uh, point. Say so here two scenarios are there. One is uh, during pandemic, uh, what we have faced, because that time we were mandated, because there is no option uh, but to adopt the online system to keep on, you know, alive our education system, teaching learning process and evaluations at the basic level. And uh, other point is that uh, as per NEP, uh, national education policy, the accessibility to the education and also in last session, I have heard about you know, uh, uh, the digital university, not last session, some other session, uh, the government is uh, uh, proposing uh, uh, today uh, during the NIRF uh, result uh, declarations that uh, Honorable Minister uh, digital university they are uh, talking about. So uh, your factor is that uh, the gross enrollment ratio of uh, the age group from 1 to 5 or 6 today we have. So after 15 to 20 years, uh, just let, have, let us have the estimate that number of uh, scholars or students will be there in the higher education. So it will simply double. So, uh, if it is now around uh, 4 crore, so it will be minimum 8 crore. If you want to achieve the 50% of the gross enrollment ratio. So, now come to the accessibility and affordability um, at the grassroots level. So, you have to, first of all, accessibility the, to the educations at all levels, not only the higher education level, because higher education level access, uh, this gross, gross enrollment ratio will be fulfilled if primary, nursery, primary, and higher secondary educations, that level is rectified so that they are coming. So, you have, op op we have options is that uh, besides this regular education system, we must adopt the online uh, education. So, if you adopt the online educations, then those uh, uh, citizens or the students, those who are SCDG, the socially, economically uh, disadvantaged groups we are talking about, they physically come to the education's primary, of course it will be approachable distance, but higher education it will be long distance sometimes because those infrastructures are not available in and around, uh, especially in the remote places. So in that case, if I keep aside this pandemic uh, factor away, temporarily now talk about the building of the India, so uh, now you, uh, what, what burden will be there and, and, and plan or strategic development will be there in the uh, infrastructure level, specifically the bandwidth. So not only the bandwidth, uh, the, as rightly you have told that if Wi-Fi uh, facility cannot be provided in the remote area, uh, so government has to come out with different strategy where in some office or uh, beyond working or some schools where uh, Wi-Fi can be provided to attend the classes, uh, but that will uh, not serve the purpose uh, wholeheartedly for 100 percent, but there will be some uh, students who will be in the remote area and for them bandwidth will be very costly. So whether government will come out with the policy to facilitate those students, have subsidized cost that yes, this much bandwidth will be available so that uh, they can attend the classes online and get the degree because now the kind of flexibility with the induction of NEP has been given, the degree can be done uh, 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 in fragmented way also. 
so first year, second year, and third year, and final year like that. Uh, then another cost is involved your uh, device cost. So if two children, two childs are there in a uh, children are there in a family, so two devices minimum, and then mobile device and laptop. Uh, so that cost is involved because in mobile you cannot do everything. Uh, the the uh, preparing the notes and other study purpose you need uh, need certain desktop or laptop type of things and uh, and then other factor is coming in those type of economically backward or uh, poor uh, sections of the people disadvantaged people uh, the ambience at the home because two children cannot attend the class in the same room so it th those are uh, the challenges uh, I think government will certainly come out with, uh, will address this, that if digital university or online education will be given to all eligible universities so that they can launch the online programs and these students can do. But again, this bandwidth and the devices and the uh, ambience of the, and the infrastructures at the family level, those are the factors still will be there. And then evaluations, of course, uh, if online evaluation is to be done, and, and that system we have already do we have faced during pandemic, uh, that was the major constraint. And uh, of course, the primary schools or high schools and other infrastructures will be there where, uh, for evaluation purpose, examination purpose, uh, government can come out with some strategy to address these issues. So these are all ground level issues to be addressed at the policy level, and then uh, this. In the access level, if you are successful, and then in the higher education, this uh, the target of 50 percent uh, gross enrollment ratio will be feasible. So this is the scenario. Okay. Can address this. <coughs> Thank you, Jasprit. I'll put the same question to you from an industry perspective. Uh, infrastructure connectivity not uniform across the country. Costs often prohibitive for many. Uh, what's the solution from an industry perspective? Um, Dr. Khara uh, talked about some government subsidies. So th that has to come at a policy level. How can the industry help uh, in sort of economizing uh, some of these solutions? Correct. So uh, I think, first of all, I totally agree with what Professor Khara said because uh, to make an impact at a scale that we're talking about, government intervention in terms of enabling mobile reach, enabling Wi-Fi reach, enabling bank, you know, uh, internet reach to the last mile of, uh, uh, of, of the Indian citizen has to be there. In terms, uh, there is one angle I think the panelists uh, um, probably did not cover is that the aspirations and I think they are more suited than I am, the aspirations of that India versus the aspirations of India in a tier 1, tier 2 city could be completely different. Um, uh, my wife happens to be uh, working with an NGO uh, in the site space and she visits uh, you know, islands where uh, the houses are still mud made. Right? Uh, if you are talking about that India, that India probably education is still a far-fetched dream. Leave aside online education, education itself is a far-fetched dream. Um, but if we come, let's say, for the sake of discussion, if we come to tier 2, tier 3 cities, in fact, tier 3 also, tier 3 also has decent amount of connectivity in terms of, in terms of 2G and 3G. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The second aspect that you asked me was, how can industry help? And I think a lot of industry uh, has been doing this, that, you know, they have been reaching out. And, and because the manpower, specifically areas where manpower is uh, required in abundance, for example, TCS and, and other such industries where they every year they kind of want to hire 1,000 students and 500 students at a stretch, they probably go to the uh, education institutes and say, hey, listen, train those people for us in a way that we want and we will assist you in teaching them in an online mode. So let's say uh, I'm TCS and I want let's say 1000 students and it's from the same pool of students that is available. I would rather go out and say listen uh, you have the students I know you're facing difficulties I will sponsor uh, you know mobile tablets and all those things but you promise me that these children will be taught in a method so that my uh, industry uh, education to industry time decreases drastically. So I think that's one area uh, where industry can help in 
uh, otherwise i think uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the education till tier 2 till 3 city i i believe that you know uh, the mobile penetration and data penetration is enough uh, one one last point i wanted to add was that uh, and i have said this in a lot of forums that uh, virtual reality is something that needs to be seriously explored by by the industry at this point in time um, uh, 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 you know, professors mentioned that you know in the legal space there has to be you know to and fro in terms of uh, in terms of a case uh, the the it is i think in the education space time has come that institutes look out at virtual realities and uh, you know artificial reality uh, as a serious medium of education uh, imagine uh, professor khara sitting here and there are 10000 universities seeing him live not just as a, as a 2d screen but as a 3d model of professor khara himself uh, that is something that has to be the next uh, mode of uh, you know education and once that comes into place uh, i think the infrastructure itself will follow and the government itself will do that so that's my take on what you okay. say uh, thank you uh, now i'll uh, come uh, starting with dr tabrez uh, one round with all the panelists and very briefly one minute to each of you uh, we talked about the challenges uh, some of the issues but most important is action. So going forward, uh, and we are talking, uh, we would have to live with some amount of online learning, whatever we call it, hybrid, blended, uh, high flex, we discussed it yesterday. So whatever, it, there will be a significant online component to it. And uh, we need uh, workforce skill to tomorrow's uh, industry uh, orientation. So in light of both this and uh, all our infrastructural challenges, however we wish, will not go away tomorrow. So keeping these three scenarios in mind, what should be the immediate action, uh, starting with you, Dr. Tabrez, one minute you have. I think we have to first try to filter out what can be delivered in the online, what can be offline. Because blending is now the, uh, uh, it will continue and further grow. As UC has said that we can deliver 40% content online. But the question is that what can be delivered online, what can be delivered offline? Because we also have to see the student engagement and experience. So that we are hearing the thoughts from Dr. Khar and also from Jaspreet and others that uh, uh, there are a lot of cost issues, there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of the uh, software issues, there are a lot of investments are required from government and all. So uh, once we are very clear that what can be delivered online, my idea is that what are the unproductive work must be going to the online mode for example lot of examination work where faculty is engaged fully in the classroom just to sit for three hours just to see about the uh, kind of the examination going on you not giving anything back so examination can be uh, barring few it can be delivered to the online mode because we have the proctoring softwares are coming we can we can also students uh, will be coming to the campus just for examination see the time they're wasting in traveling and all the kind of pain they're taking that time can be utilized for raising their quality and standards they can do better perform better in the examination they can learn better and also faculty can save time those are wasting in the exam organization they can also do some research publish some papers so once you do proper uh, kind of the uh, analysis we have to filter out that what are the activities can be given online what can be offline and also if you go to the further in the content some content i just mentioned in my earlier speech that uh, some can be delivered uh, online because uh, it is very easy but some of the finer content where a lot of discussion debates are required innovations are required creativity is required where those are problem solving skills where we have to uh, kind of find out the solution this one might be engaged, for example, legal education, management education, lot of areas there where a lot of debates are required because they have to raise the standard, they have to develop the quality of the leadership of the analysis and all. Those areas must be uh, kind of be delivered uh, in the offline mode where student engagement experience are required because a lot of peer learning will be happening in the physical mode that we are missing in the online mode. Because uh, uh, if you see that people who are fed up by the online, they sometimes feel bored, they want to do and do social networking and uh, coordination and all. So that could the component that of filtering out and also dividing that what are the areas, what are the components can be delivered online, offline mode, where a lot of analysis required by the experts, faculty should sit together and decide. If you can filter out properly, kind of uh, deliver in a very professional way, it will be a great, great thing for us. 
unless we are just bothered in the pandemic we are just bound to do online there's no option but now we have realized we have seen the experience we can filter out and can have better output and better engagement thank you thank you yes uh, dr shridharan uh, to add on to my colleagues so i would basically like to say two points over here first thing first and foremost is we as a student who spends 30 to 40 hours inside an institution how many hours is the student spending only listening to the faculty that can be completely moved online whereas the time which the student spends in terms of laboratory work project work peer peer work or any hands on activity that is the time which we should focus on and i think the pandemic has really taught us that like you know, the importance of face to face interaction the importance of human interaction and how precious that is and how we miss that over the last two years is something which we really need to think upon and see in every course i'm sure every course has a lecture component a tutorial component a practical component and multiple components depends depending upon the activities so where which can be done online which can be done face to face that is something like you know which academia also needs to ponder and kind of revitalize and i would say reinvent itself that's something like you know which cannot happen overnight but start at the course level and then maybe at like you know at the overall at the institution level we can look into that so that's the first point i wanted to mention second thing where i'd like to say like you know in terms of the education and online education how to make the students industry ready as of now unfortunately the current scenario in most academic institutions is that our training for the industry is done in bits and pieces and that too by a third party solution it is not integrated into the day to day activities of the student and the institution as a whole if we are able to change that if you like you know for example if you look at institutions abroad there is no training and placement center at all there is no training and placement office like you know in most cases there is only an office of career services wherein students can go and get information and then like you know look out and apply for jobs on their own and students are doing really well over there so how instead of having bits and pieces kind of have the assessments activities included in such a way that they prepare the students for to be job ready and to be industry ready is also something academic institutions need to think and evolve going forward with the help of industry also thank you thank you yes dr sujata so i completely agree with uh, professor ahmed and fellow colleague but i have one point pandemic has taught us how to deal with challenges all of sudden and innovate ourselves so my focus they have given focus on assessment and few other part my focus is completely on pedagogy and the content which we deliver in either in physical classroom or online classroom we have to change that we have to upskill our faculty members reskill integrated with technology to use technology to teach online and plus offline uh, why i am saying this because synchronous and asynchronous these one the, this one is the reality for our content development we have gamification we have simulation what he talked about virtual reality these are certain ways and we found during pandemic the way we created engagement for our students with breakout rooms so this is not like the way we have to change and adapt and accept that is the mindset and attitude of faculty members and institutions as well so this is my first thing use all virtual component in your teaching gamification is such a nice way to engage students so many simulations are available to simulate in online mode second part very short i just want to say and request to all um, uh, faculty members or academician that we have to give focus on for employability the cold learning cycle observation is required through uh, like uh, industry uh, industry academia partnership they can go and observe then abstract is important then they can concept conceptualize and then with the help of faculty and academician they can experiment so this one is the cycle if students are using properly they will not have any challenge related to employability thank you thank you uh, dr khara so i will just uh, present the scenario of my university the practical uh, scenario say medical and dental nursing we could not stop even during the peak of the pandemic 
uh, because it was mandated also, mandate, mandate was there that because medical educations cannot be run online. No such online courses, contents also such available for medical, but now they are thinking. So similarly, dental, medical along with that nursing. And then we have a second largest uh, school, the Allied Health Science. So these four schools, during pandemic for a single day, uh, it was not stopped. The program actually was running. Now come to the uh, virtual scenario. Computer science, there was not much problem because cloud-based server was there, softwares are installed, so, and there you have monitoring system also in the server-based and then in the console through user login, they will be doing coding and other things. Uh, except few hand-holding and practical debugging, all those things. But the other side, mechanical, electronics, civil engineering, and then uh, your biotech, architecture, agriculture, where people, where students has to go to the field and we have a lot of agriculture plantation and laboratories. We face and design as well as uh, other uh, such activity based wherever. How, uh, pharmacy. So how do we run these courses, these programs online? We faced a lot of problems on that, although we tried to give certain videos and uh, emulate certain things and some of the laboratories are postponed that when university will reopen, then we'll conduct those experiments. So this is the ground experience with us while we are running the university. But however, as uh, Zamed has, uh, has rightly, to, uh, Sridhar has rightly told that it depends the content, the theory, where you only, your hypothesis, your theory, your understanding and, and, and few of the story involved. So there you can have, uh, whether you do online or offline, it is same, only thing is that in the online student physically will be present, so some additive benefit is there because of physical interaction. So other development also will happen. Otherwise, as far as content delivery is concerned, as Madam has rightly told, no problem. But where experiential learning, where physical involvement is required, so there is a concern, great concern. So uh, Professor Ahmed has rightfully told that we appropriately have to choose the content which can be given online and which cannot be given online. I'll just give one example that say we have a we have kitchen and lot of utensils are there. So if one utensil is not there, other using other utensils we can no uh, solve the problem of uh, making one omelette if my frying pan is not there. But that does not mean that uh, that that will be the habitual and knowledge we can do that because there is a concern. So we need to understand. We can do that prov provided that we do some innovation there. So that innovation then depends on the faculty capability and with the experience. So if without innovation, state forward, if we adopt this online for certain experiential learning, so that probably will be the wrong applications. So we need to do it very carefully. But other domain I have not spoken so far that industry, just I will take a minute. Uh, say we university have industry collaborations. Uh, specifically in my university, each kind of collaboration is there. We have industry collaborated program, but that is for only computer science and business. We have uh, industry supported research lab. We have industry collaboration for very high end research with Pratista group for fermentation and microbial testing and all, and many more other. But, but my objective is that, our objective or objective should be that in gross level at the university, what industry connect culture we can build. So basic platform where we need to establish is that where an ecosystem is to be built up that all the faculty members and student at the very bottom level let them take up one industry problem as a part of their project and have the industry based problem solving learning. When we enter in that, that, will, that should happen in the gross level and then you have lot of achievements because you are connected then depending on the intensity, placement, industry, expert involvement, research, collaboration, all things which usually has to happen. But things are happening where to showcase we have lot of examples but gross level industry has to do some transformation and make the ecosystem that all the programs, all the faculty members are connected with the industry and this basic level is met. So this is required. Thanks, thanks. That's very uh, interesting and innovative suggestion. Just uh, the last word is with you. So 
I think uh, everything that has to be said on this topic has already been said. Uh, I'd like to add one last point to it, and which is in continuation to what I said last time, uh, and which is in addition to what Dr. Tabrez said. Uh, while we look at what can be delivered online and what can be delivered physically, we should go one step beyond and seriously think as to what can be delivered online with better performances. So rather than looking at courses saying that this is a course we divide it into online and physical, we should rather look at a question saying out of this, what is it that can be better delivered online? In terms, uh, if for example, uh, experiential learning somebody talked about, can the experiential learning be better if it is uh, supported with technology and delivered online rather than rather than physically or physically online, which means that you are present in terms of the students, but you are delivering it online. I think that's something that is an area where uh, you know we have not spoken about, and that's something. I genuinely feel the you know the institute should talk about. And that's the only point I think I have to add on top of that. Uh, thanks. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, Gopi Krishna Arora to hand over uh, memento uh, to our panelists. Uh, so, can we have Dr. Tabrez Ahmed? that we come to the end of the uh, two day uh, APAC fourth global education and skills conclave. Thanks to all the participants for making it such an interactive uh, couple of days. Thank you.